Let me ask you a deceptively simple question. What is the difference between dependency inversion and inversion of control? And while you're at it, could you also explain to me how dependency injection fits into those two concepts? If you don't have an answer to these two questions, then you've come to the exactly right place today. As part of the Interface Masterclass series, I want to show you in a very clear and distinct way what separates dependency inversion from inversion of control and how dependency injection is used to achieve inversion of control. And if you're a regular on this channel, you know that we will use an example to facilitate faster learning and make the explanations less abstract. So let's get going. Today's example will be a strongly simplified version of a temperature controller. This controller creates an instance of a heater and stores it as a member. Throughout this lecture, we will take a very close look at the relation between these two classes and how modifying this relation can improve modularity of our code. In our example, the temperature controller represents a high-level module, while the heater acts as a low-level module. Note that modules could also be called components or services, but for this lecture I'm going to stick to module. A possible definition I would like to bring in here is that a module A is considered a higher level module than module B if A invokes functionality from B and or A orchestrates the overall behavior, while B provides specialized functionality. With this definition in mind, we can see that high and low level module is a term relative to the current part of the system we are looking at. If we were to take a closer look at the heater implementation, we could see that the heater class orchestrates its own lower level modules and uses functionality of, for example, a heating coil and a fan. But let's stick to the code on the screen now. The temperature controller has a run function, in which it uses functionality provided by the heater via its public API. Of course, a real temperature controller would require more than just a heater to function, but this is a didactic example and will do for the purposes of this lecture. Because the temperature controller requires the heater to do its job, we could say that it depends on the heater. And the definition is quite simple here. A depends on B if A calls the public API of B. And purely talking semantics, that directly implies that the heater is therefore a dependency of the temperature controller. The way the code is currently written is what we call traditional dependency. In traditional dependency, high-level modules depend on low-level modules. So, what's the problem? Seems kind of reasonable, doesn't it? Well, as soon as the low-level module changes, we get ripple effects into high-level modules due to the dependency. It is in the nature of how software works that low-level modules are concerned with details, while high-level modules typically focus on orchestration of low-level modules. And details tend to change a lot more than the way we orchestrate our classes. Thus, this dependency of the high-level modules on lower-level modules creates a lot of unnecessary changes in the high-level modules. Think about this. The hardware of the heater and consequently the implementation details of how to use it will change way more often than the fact that the heater has to be turned on in order to raise the temperature. Or let's take a CSV parser as another example. How you get a string that contains CSV data might change, i.e. the file format, the way the file is read, or maybe you get it through a HTTP request. But parsing CSV data will not change once implemented correctly. Besides the upwards ripple effects of changes, traditional dependency also leads to bad testability of high-level modules. It's easy to see that in order to test a high-level module, all its dependencies need to be present and they need to work. As soon as a dependency breaks, the tests for the high-level module also break. On top of that, the dependencies might be expensive to set up, i.e. accessing a database, which increases the runtime as well as the time it takes us to develop tests. Testing edge cases like recovering from a failed database access are also hard to test, because you intentionally have to manipulate the database to achieve the desired behavior. The third major drawback of designing classes with a traditional dependency structure 
is that high-level modules are not configurable. The heater is a hard-coded dependency of the temperature controller. With this design, if you can even call it a design, it's not possible to use a different heater or a different device altogether, like an AC. Making changes to the used heater would entail changes in the temperature controller class itself. So now that we see the traditional dependency structure is leaving us with all those problems, we should be asking, can we simply invert the dependency? So can we go from this to this and just call it dependency inversion and we're done? Well, not directly. We earlier stated that dependency means using another class's public API and the temperature controller uses the heater API, not the other way around. Or in other words, the high-level module always needs to interact with its low-level modules and thus depends on their public API. So, what can we do then? Well, we could start by introducing an abstraction between the high and the low-level module. In this case, I chose an interface, because it is the core element of this video series after all. But you could use an abstract base class as well, doesn't really matter. Interfaces are typically the more common abstraction to use here though. Introducing this abstraction of the heater has inverted half of the dependency i.e. the heater implementation now has an upwards dependency, as it needs to provide the interface. But the temperature controller still depends on the public API of the iHeater interface. The really important part, and this is something that so many developers don't fully understand, is that the interface definition needs to be dictated by the high-level module, so that it becomes a part of it. Then, and only then, we can speak of dependency inversion. And this becomes quite evident if we make the modules themselves opaque. Only one dependency error remains, and it points upwards from the low-level module towards the high-level module. And we can clearly see now that this is the inversion of our traditional dependency. So now that we have seen that it is a requirement for dependency inversion that the abstraction becomes a part of the high-level module, the question arises, how can we make sure that the high-level module owns the abstraction? Well, we could start by defining the abstraction in the high-level module's namespace, or whatever your preferred programming language offers in terms of grouping mechanisms. This clearly states our intention that there should be a strong coherence between the abstraction and the high-level module. That's a good starting point, but not merely sufficient, I suppose. The critical point is that we need to design the API of the abstraction based on the needs of the high-level module. In this example case, we should ask, what does the temperature controller need from a heater in order to control the temperature, rather than what can the heater provide? And a good way of going about this is to define the abstraction before implementing the low-level modules. This implies that you are designing your system top to bottom, i.e. general capabilities first and details will be designed last. But most of the projects I have been a part of are planned this way, and it only makes sense. It's clear at the beginning what general service the software should provide, and typically you also have a rough idea about how it's going to do this. But the details are not discussed until much later, so using dependency inversion in your code design perfectly fits the typical flow of a project. Now guys, you know it, I know it, I have to beat this dead horse in every video, the solid principles. The D in solid stands for dependency inversion principle. There are three main recommendations for it. Number one is, high level modules should not depend on low level modules. This is what we discussed in length now. Number two, both high and low level modules should depend on abstractions instead. Quite evidently, that's the case. And number three, which is the most important, but also least understood one, abstractions should not depend on details. And what is so crucial to understand here is that details often means implementations of low-level modules. Which comes back to what we just saw. Dependency inversion only works when the high-level modules own the abstractions. <sighs> okay, what a ride that was. 
And thank God we could finally get this one right. If you were willing to listen to all my rambling here, you'll never do this wrong again, I guarantee. So what have we gained through dependency inversion? I'm sure all our problems are gone now, or are they? Well, let's look at our changed code. I added the interface definition for our I heater here, and the temperature controller now stores the heater implementation behind an interface. This prohibits us from calling any functionality that is not part of the public API defined in the interface. By doing this, we surely got rid of the ripple effects that changes in low-level modules would initiate, because the low-level module has to adhere to the abstraction, which in turn cannot be changed, so the high-level module can work with a robust abstraction and thus doesn't need to change. However, our high-level module still has really bad testability, for all the reasons I outlined before. Even though the heater is now hidden behind an interface, its instantiation is still hard-coded in the constructor. And for the same reason, we can also not configure the temperature controller to use a different implementation of the iHeater interface. So where we need to go now is control. I switched the representation here a bit to indicate ownership in the broadest sense. The heater is depicted inside the temperature controller because it is owned by it. Or, in other words, the temperature controller controls the heater. My definition is that module A controls module B if it constructs it and manages its lifetime. This is clearly the case in our example. And I would like to again point at the two problems we still have. Because the construction of a heater is hard-coded, we cannot stop it for tests or exchange it for a different iHeater implementation. Our example showcases the traditional approach to control, in which high-level modules control low-level modules. This approach leads to the two problems we have, bad testability and lack of configurability. And we can only solve those problems by inverting both dependency and control. Now oh, we already inverted the dependencies, so let's look at how we can invert control now. Our goal is that the heater should be living outside of the temperature controller. And in order to function, the temperature controller then needs to obtain some kind of reference to the heater. Again, implement whatever fits to your programming language. The first question that comes to mind is, who should then control the heater, if not the temperature controller? There are a few popular choices. If your project is small, it might be enough to just construct all dependencies in the main function. If your project is a bit larger though, you might want to consider outsourcing the dependency control into a configuration or a setup class. And of course, if you want a scalable, easy to use solution, feel free to use one of the available dependency injection containers or even code one yourself. Now that the question is answered, the next one arises. How will the dependencies be injected into the high-level modules? Of course, you guessed it. It's dependency injection. This is our code without dependency injection. And this is our code with dependency injection. Dependency injection, often abbreviated as DI, is when the dependencies of a class are not instantiated by the class itself, but provided from the outside. By the way, don't mix it up with dependency inversion principle, which we covered before. Some people also abbreviate that with DI, and that becomes a real mess. Dependencies can range from configuration integers, like the wattage of the heater, to large services, like a database access. So yes, even if you just provide the initial state of a class through its constructor, strictly speaking, that's dependency injection. So you are already doing it, all the time. And dependency injection is one mechanism for implementing inversion of control. It is the most popular, by far I would say, but there are others, like using a service locator. So yes, dependency injection is quite trivial, but so powerful. And you can become more powerful by learning two more ways of doing dependency injection in just one slide. Here we go. What we just did is called constructor injection, where the dependencies are provided via parameters of a constructor call. If you want a bit more flexibility at runtime, 
you can do setter injection. Like this you can switch dependency anytime. Note that with the shown approach, the heater member can be null before the setter is called, and to avoid that you could combine constructor and setter injection. And last but not least, we got method injection. If you don't need or want to store a dependency as a member, you can inject it as a parameter into a method, which then locally uses the dependency. So let's now go to the final chapter. Why is the combination of dependency inversion and inversion of control so powerful? We already saw that through dependency inversion, we got rid of the ripple effects of changes. And by adding inversion of control, we now gained the ability to inject mock objects for testing, allowing us to test high-level modules in isolation or fake some dependency behavior. In addition to that, we can now configure our high-level modules by injecting a different service with a different behavior into the same spot, which is generalized by an abstraction. Talking more broadly, this combination of design principles is so common because it enables us to design systems that are maintainable throughout the long project lifecycle, testable with high code coverage and reasonable effort, configurable without changing code in the modules themselves, extensible by adding new functionality that provides known interfaces, and modular to a degree where even after 100,000 lines of code, the responsibilities of the individual modules can still be separated. Well, provided that you follow some other design principles as well. Some of these characteristics could also be described as the requirement for a well-designed system. And to come full circle here, we started the series by talking about interfaces, remember? I would like to mention here that abstraction is the absolute key to all of this. Without abstractions, dependency inversion cannot even exist. Without abstractions, inversion of control makes very little sense. And the most common abstractions used for dependency inversion and inversion of control are interfaces. That's one of the biggest reasons why you should master interfaces. They're absolutely ubiquitous, both in high-level design principles and concrete design patterns. So let me now ask you once again, do you have a very clear picture in your mind about what separates dependency inversion from inversion of control? And how dependency injection facilitates inversion of control? If so, hit the like button, consider subscribing to stay alert for future content in this style, and just give yourself some rest to let the new knowledge sink in. I'll see you in the next one with Green Tea Coding.